to the Omali Taught Me Weekly Political Study featuring Chairman Omali at the time. The topic will be What Will a Liberated Africa Look Like? This study comes from the point of the sphere featured in the September issue of the Burning Sphere. Please know that during the study you will be muted in order to foster the best learning experience for everyone. You can download the study material and follow along right now if you go to omalitaughtme.eventbrite.com. Please take notes and write down any questions you may have during the study as there will be a question and answer session at the end of the lesson. Callers are muted and they can unmute themselves. Uhur comrades, I want to welcome everybody to the study today. And it has already been determined that um, the name of the study or the title of the study for today is What Will a uh, Liberated Africa Look Like? Actually, this is, I think, uh, the eighth of nine. Uh, uh, pieces that will uh, function in the uh, that will be in the point of that spear. Uh, and it is a material excerpted, excerpted from the political report to the party's um, plenary uh, subsequent to our sixth uh, Congress. And I really uh, have enjoyed participating in this study. And I hope uh, you will be able to enjoy this also. I'm hoping that uh, people in our party, in the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, people who participate in these studies on a weekly uh, basis, and I know there are hundreds of you who do that, I hope that we are helping you to move beyond this place that, um, and time where people uh, participate in just uh, information consumption, where it's not designed to uh, put, uh, contribute to ability to forward the revolution or uh, to engage in practice, but just people hearing stuff over and over again. That's much of what happened today. And uh, I think that one of the things that we're struggling for is to help people acquire a scientific understanding of uh, how to make revolution, to broaden the vision, to help people uh, to understand that our objective has to be beyond more than simply participating in a demonstration and chanting and m more than uh, just protesting the latest uh, injustice that's happening to us any place in the world as African people. And this study uh, um, seeks to contribute to deepening our understanding and broaden our vision. Uh, we are a party that's about trying uh, to win people to participate and change in the whole world. This is a bold venture that we're talking about. We're not just talking about blocking an interstate, though interstates will have to be blocked, and we're not just talking about having uh, demonstrations, or demonstrations must occur, and we must uh, participate in leading and, and, and giving direction to those demonstrations. But what we're talking about is the kind of world that we have uh, come together to create, the kind of world that we have to destroy, uh, and the kind of world that we have to build. And revolution is a science and an art. It's not uh, something that uh, people uh, can make happen by proclamation. It's not something that uh, simply uh, infers that people will pick up some guns and do this or do that. It's a science and an art. It, it requires us to understand the science of society itself. Uh, you know, what, what is it that brought this uh, system together, uh, uh, the one that we complain so much about, the one that we see people suffering so much uh, under? What is it that uh, constitutes the, uh, uh, its foundation and what uh, will it take for us to do uh, to take that away? And what is it that we can do once we know uh, what the foundation of the system is, how can we begin to deconstruct it? Uh, because actually, in revolution, the shooting part it really ends up being the easiest part of the whole process. Uh, that is to say, even uh, the easiest part uh, is easier than, in many ways, than what has to be done before and what has to be done after. And much of what we want to talk about now is what has to be done after. How do we 
how do we uh, build a new world and what would this new world look like and who are the leading forces participating in that? And is it enough just to say that uh, uh, we're black? We want to help people understand that uh, we have to move beyond just the concept of independence and just the struggle for independence. We've seen the consequences of independence movements and throughout the world and in Africa. And, and in many ways, we've seen how that's reflected in the United States, though it hasn't been independence as we, as we would like to think we see occurring on the continent of Africa. But in many ways, it, there is not much of a difference. And what we are learning uh, is that independence is not enough. You can win independence, but uh, independence can be achieved. But the question is, what kind of social system are you going to have? Are we engaged in a struggle <laughs> to free Africa, to uh, liberate Africa, to wage uh, uh, this uh, tremendous uh, struggle that will get rid of the foreign domination and just to replace it uh, with black faces? And will that suffice? Will that make things better? Okay, we've got black president here, uh, and we've got a whole bunch of black presidents all over the continent of Africa, but we see that there's been no fundamental change. We see black presidents and prime ministers throughout the Caribbean and other places, but what difference has that made in the life of the people? And can we make a revolutionary struggle uh, that in, where independence can make a difference? And that, those are the kinds of questions that we want to grapple with, the kinds of questions that you need to be considering, especially if you are part of a party, the revolutionary instrument that is uh, created uh, and to, to take power uh, and to exercise power. And uh, these are fundamental questions that you need to be thinking about. How do we solve these problems now? You need to even know that these problems are ahead of us. Uh, so the, the political report to the plenary uh, is uh, what we used uh, to try to elaborate on many of these questions. And uh, this is a bold proclamation because you think about it, this is 2017. Uh, we... Uh, engaged in struggles everywhere. Cops are killing us in the streets of uh, the United States. Uh, we find uh, uh, ourselves fighting U.S. troops in Niger. When I say we, I'm talking about African people in West Africa, uh, that uh, resources are being looted throughout the continent. Uh, we find ourselves in many ways relatively defenseless uh, in the face of uh, what people would pose as natural disasters uh, in the Caribbean, uh, but uh, we know, of course, they're not natural. I mean, nature is natural, but the destruction of, the, of infrastructure, the sucking up of the resources that make uh, infrastructure uh, unavailable to us that would protect us or give us some kind of defense from, uh, from hurricanes and things like that, that's not natural. And yet, in the face of uh, everything that's happening to us, here we are, uh, in the African People's Socialist Party, talking about how we're going to reorganize society, how the world is going to look. And this is something that every cadre, every member of the party should be considering. And this is something that should people should be debating uh, everywhere. What kind of world is it that we're trying to construct? And whether or not we're trying to construct a new world, or are we just looking for body cameras, uh, for police, or something to that effect? So... Uh, I want us to go ahead and, and move forward uh, with the study, and, and uh, uh, I'd like to just read a bit and, uh, and comment, and uh, I do hope that, that uh, if you have questions, and you should have questions, uh, that you will make note and you'll convey them to us in a fashion that makes it possible for us to respond. I know we can do some of that by phone. And I think we have a setup here now that will allow us to monitor better uh, what you are saying online, Facebook, uh, etc. So we ought to be able uh, to deal with the question. But you should be uh, writing those questions down so when we get to that place where we can have this discussion, we can elaborate more. Uh, because I believe that uh, we're going to talk about some pretty important things. We're going to, you know, people should understand some more about this whole issue of the state. Uh, what is the state? And then, not just the state as a general uh, concept or as a, a, a simply an abstract uh, question, but what is it that distinguishes the capitalist state uh, from states that preceded it? And when we talk about states in this instance, we're talking about 
uh, the things that we've seen uh, particularly occur in Europe uh, when you know when we saw the emergence of, uh, of classes uh, uh, come uh, into very sharp and bold uh, 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 evidence and uh, and uh, and because of the emergence of class we see uh, the state this cruel uh, apparatus that's needed to protect the status quo, that's used to protect the, the status quo. And we've seen that uh, throughout European history, uh, the state has been there. We saw the, the state, you know, going all the way back uh, to uh, uh, the slavery in Europe. Uh, we saw uh, once uh, slavery was gone and feudalism came into existence, there was another uh, uh, form of the state, but it was a state nevertheless. Slavery you know, was that instance in European history where uh, people were owned, like cattle, uh, and uh, where everything they produced went to a slave master, and the two uh, contending social forces were the slaves and the slave master. And then uh, subsequent to that in Europe, uh, we saw the emergence of, of uh, what they referred to as feudalism, and feudalism lasted for something like a thousand years where uh, uh, most of the people were uh, tied to the land and the two contending social forces were uh, the uh, nobility, the land uh, lords, the land owners, uh, and the, the peasants and the serfs who worked for the, uh, the, on the land and tied to the land and uh, were not able uh, to leave the land and who worked... Uh, uh, mostly for uh, the land laws and were only able to keep a portion of what it was that uh, they, they produced for themselves, the majority going to the land lords. Uh, this was uh, uh, a form of, uh, of uh, a social system that uh, required a different kind of state from what existed under slavery. But the, social, the state under slavery was to maintain the power of the slave master and that relationship between the slave and the slave master, that's why you would have armies, that's why you would have military forces, etc., to maintain that relationship and also to contend with neighbors uh, who might be attempting to, uh, to invade. And, and, and this was particularly true throughout Europe where uh, we had hordes of uh, forces who were constantly uh, invading and raiding each other. Uh, and then a feudalism, a different kind of state that many of us are more familiar with through movies and, and fantasy stories and Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham uh, that was there to protect this relationship between uh, the nobility, the landlords, the landowners, and the peasants and the serfs, uh, the sheriff that was constantly t collecting taxes and extorting more and more uh, from the peasants and the landlord. The state has a responsibility, this coercive institution, this instrument of force and coercion that, uh, that is uh, designed to give the rulers, the ruling class, a monopoly on violence. Uh, so the state looked a certain way under those conditions. And then uh, in Europe we saw uh, the feudalist, feudalism overthrown. And with the overthrow of feudalism, uh, another state, another social force, another class comes into power, and this class uh, is uh, the, the, the capitalist class. And uh, typically, it's understood that the capitalists are uh, in contention primarily uh, with the workers. And certainly, uh, we saw that certainly was the case in Europe. We saw the capitalists can, uh, uh, who were bleeding uh, the European workers, uh, sparking revolutionary attempts among uh, the workers or by the workers against uh, the capitalist class. And as we've understood it historically and traditionally, and what most of us have been taught, is that the two social forces in contention, the two critical social forces under capitalism, have been the workers uh, and the capitalist class, the owning class, the bourgeoisie, that class that owned and controlled the means of production, on the one hand. Uh, but what, what uh, and so the state, is that instrument <laughs> that protects that relationship, that uh, protects the ability of exploitation of the working class, uh, that uh, is, is, is organized to uh, protect uh, uh, the interests of the working class of one particular country, 
versus another country that competes with us. So you have armies and uh, marines and naval forces and, and big ships and guns and all of that. And that's the state. All of that functions as the sheriff's department, your local killer cop in your community is a part of the state apparatus. Again, uh, uh, it is there to maintain the status quo, to maintain this relationship between the oppressed and the oppressor. You have to have this instrument there if you have a society that's divided between those who have and those who don't have, and especially if those who got stuff got it as a consequence of taking it from those who don't have, and that the, the, the stability of this relationship uh, uh, depends uh, on maintaining uh, 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 the domination, the class domination uh, of, the, of the rulers, this ruling class. And so the state is here, but the state in the capitalist class uh, uh, for the capitalist class or in the capitalism is different. And it's, it's, it's a state just like the feudal state was a state, just like the slave state uh, was different, but the capitalist state comes into existence as a consequence of, of, of what previously occurred in feudalism uh, where you had this groups of people who left and, and went out and began to capture human beings and sell them as slaves and capture lands and territories and became wealthy and powerful uh, inside the feudal system uh, to the point where they were able to overthrow the kings and the queens and the nobility and take power themselves. And they call this a struggle for freedom. They call this a struggle uh, for, for democracy. Uh, it was the overthrow of the old feudal order, off with the heads, kings and queens, uh, uh, met uh, grisly fate uh, as a consequence of this new social force coming into being, fighting for freedom and fighting for democracy, freeing themselves from feudal tyranny, uh, freeing themselves from the sheriff of Nottingham, and all these other things that, uh, that we know from fable and, so, and many instances from reality. And also it took um, these serfs and peasants, some of whom were literally naked, they were so poor, it, it brought all kinds of resources to them. And how did this happen? And it happened through going into Africa and capturing black people and capturing black territories and going into what is now called the Americas. It's called the Americas now because a white man who uh, Vespucio Americas or something like that from Italy, uh, his name is attached to all these territories uh, that, that Italians... And, and Spaniards and the rest of them have no historical connection to except they invaded it. And as a consequence of invading it, shipped whole bunches of resources back to Spain, back to Italy, back to Europe. And then and many of them stayed here in these places and they made what they call revolution because they wanted to free themselves uh, from the thieves uh, who, uh, who they worked for before and they wanted a big, bigger piece of action so they had revolutions. They wanted democracy on indigenous land. They wanted democracy uh, 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 to be able to have uh, the resources created by African people who have been enslaved, the workers who have been enslaved. So this is, this is the capitalist state emerges now, uh, and it's a democratic state. It's brought democracy and freedom to white people, but it's come as a consequence of what has happened, this plague that has been visited upon the planet Earth, uh, enslaved African colonized masses of people around the world. So the state, we'll talk a little bit about the state. And the state uh, is not exactly what, what uh, Marx and Engels and Lenin and other people uh, described in the past. It, it certainly is coercive. It certainly is an institution for, uh, for protecting the interests of the ruling class and protecting the interests and, and, and maintaining the, the status quo. Uh, but the capitalist state has a function that I think uh, people like Marx and Engels uh, and Lenin never fully understood and many other people who were engaged in revolutionary struggle never understood. So we're going to be dealing with that somewhat in this discussion. And I hope I haven't pushed you away uh, by now. But I want to go ahead and, and do some reading. Uh, uh, and I'm going to start after the introduction uh, on the first page of this uh, article in the Burning Spear newspaper. And you should have the Burning Spear newspaper. You should read the Burning Spear newspapers. <laughs> and if you can, you should distribute the Burning Spear newspaper so everybody else would be reading this publication. 
uh, and uh, people in the African People's Social Party, if you think that this study and this discussion and important people in the Uhuru movement, uh, you should see an absolute need to make sure that everybody you know is reading the Burning Spear. I mean, we need to be in our communities, uh, selling the spear and getting it out. But I'm going to start now after the introduction. And uh, this continues. Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, an excerpt, and this is uh, the eighth, I think, of, uh, uh, yeah, eighth in a series of nine. And uh, since that time, uh, I'm following up from the last uh, uh, segment. Since that time, the first quarter of the 20th century, after many uh, setbacks, serious class-based battles within the African community, and the establishment of neo-colonialism as a generalized condition for African people, we are forced to look beyond national liberation to the question of the kind of society we are fighting for, we are fighting for, and to identify the, act, the social forces necessary to achieve it. So, um, that's another of the things that we're, we'll be talking about too, is the fact that uh, many Africans, and especially nationalists, don't want to deal with the question of uh, class struggle inside the African community. And I say especially nationalists because most of the people who are identified and groups identified as nationalists are people who are able to fight around the question of independence. Uh, but in most instances, they are talking about an independence that will not uh, thrust the working class to uh, uh, the forefront and to the leadership of society, which means that they're talking about creating a bourgeois society or a capitalist society, and they're talking about a, a bourgeois nationalist or a capitalist nationalist. So many nationalists, you know, uh, don't want to recognize the question, the issue of class struggle, but class struggle and class contradictions do exist within the African community. If you don't get that, you'll never be able to understand why you can have 54 so-called independent African states and none of them uh, satisfying or serving the interests of African people. Or you can have so-called black power uh, throughout the Caribbean and none of that serves the interests of the vast majority of African workers and, and peasants. Uh, the people are still suffering and in many ways what we have is just uh, uh, black capitalism uh, or capitalism function in black skin uh, that continues to explore and so uh, we, we'll be looking at this question as part of what we're looking at. So Africa, Africans, a once free people existing within our own independent economic economies in Africa have been transformed into commodities, into commodities, first capital, uh, and producers of capital, first workers. The first workers in this society, in the, under capitalism, were black people, workers, African people. We were, the, we, were the, we were commodities, you know, for sale. We were commodities, and that's what capitalist production is all about, creation of commodities. Uh, everything that's uh, produced uh, uh, under capitalism is uh, for sale, and that's what a commodity is. That's something that's produced for trade or sale. And so here you have uh, uh, Africa, Africans have been transformed into commodities. Think about that. A whole nation of people uh, understood to be commodities. And when people think of slavery, they don't think about uh, Spartacus. They don't think about Spartacus in Rome. They don't think about Kirk Douglas when they think about uh, uh, slavery. They think about black people. When, when, mm -hmm. when a white woman gets upset and stomps her foot and says to her husband, you're treating me like a slave, She's talking about treating, uh, not like, like Kirk Douglas, but, but about black people. Uh, and f the concept of slavery is something that's uh, particular and peculiar uh, to black people. It's just like when black people think about God. They think they see something white. <laughs> you understand? Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so here we are. We say that uh, Africans are once uh, free people existing within our own independent economies in Africa have been turned, have been transformed in, into commodities, first capital, the first capital in the capitalist system, and producers of capital, the first workers within the capitalist system, within a social system 
that is defined by the relationship between capitalist production and producers resting on a foundation of slavery and colonial domination of peoples and territories. Uh, national liberation serves the purpose of freeing uh, Africans from direct foreign domination. However, direct foreign domination is not necessary for vicious, life-draining economic exploitation uh, uh, either by foreigners or domestic capital, foreign or domestic capital. So we say that national liberation serves to a uh, purpose of freeing Africans from direct foreign domination, but for direct foreign domination is not necessary uh, uh, for uh, vicious and life-draining uh, uh, economic exploitation either by foreign or domestic capital. National liberation, if I seem hesitant reading this, is because I've experienced, I'm recovering from eye surgery. So it's, a, it's you know, some struggle right now dealing with this. But national liberation under uh, the leadership of the African uh, petty bourgeoisie leaves in place a, a system of exploitation. So you have national liberation, the nation, quote unquote, in theory, has been liberated from direct foreign uh, domination, but it leaves in place a system of exploitation. The capitalist system is still there. You just got black people managing the capitalist system. That's what you got in the Bahamas, comrades, uh, and, and other places all over the continent of Africa. So we say that uh, African uh, toilers, producers, continue to be exploited under the ages of a, dom a domestic flag, which may even be, uh, as in Libya, a red, black, and green flag, right? Uh, so that it ain't enough. I mean, <laughs> I can see a police department armed with red, black, and green billy clubs. You understand? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, who is in charge? Who, you know, what social force is? That's the real question we're looking at. So, for, to be victorious, our revolution must take place under the leadership of the African working class. This is the role of the African People's Socialist Party, the advanced detachment, the general staff of the African working class. We are the advanced detachment of that class. Every class uh, is represented in the world. And the bourgeoisie has this party that represents it, and in the, in the Democrat and Republican Party in terms of its leadership, function as the advanced detachment of the bourgeoisie, of the white ruling class. It has some Negroes in it, uh, but it's the advanced detachment of the white ruling class. So only the African working class, aligned uh, with other toilers, especially uh, the poor peasants, uh, has a stake in destroying uh, the entire system of exploitation and all of its attendant structures, including uh, the artificial borders that uh, exploit uh, Africa and function as the uh, incubators uh, for the reproduction of uh, the neo-colonial petty bourgeois class as a social force. That's what the borders do. It, uh, they, that's an incubator. That's the place where the, the African neo-colonial petty bourgeoisie uh, is reproduced inside uh, these colonial borders. That's why they have to be destroyed. Uh, only and because uh, in many ways those borders protect the petty bourgeoisie too. And, and the neo-colonialists. The neo-colonialists are going to have to be destroyed. It's, it's, it's that simple. Only the African working class is uh, compelled to fight for the destruction of class society and the exploitation that produced it. Under the independent revolutionary leadership of the African working class, organized under African internationalist uh, principles, uh, victory will mean the defeat of foreign ex uh, imperialists and their domestic minions. It will mean that the toilers, the workers and poor peasants in particular, will become the new temporary ruling class, the custodians of the means of production 
now owned and controlled uh, by uh, capitalists, uh, mostly foreign. Liberation under the leadership of the African, uh, of African internationalist uh, informed workers, organized as in the African People's Socialist Party, will mean uh, the end of economic exploitation. And once the, and, and, and once the uh, imperialists and African uh, petty bourgeois neocolonialists have been uh, crushed, the end of all exploitation. This means that African women who will play a fundamental role in the liberation of our Africa and rise to full stature with all the rights and authority uh, this infers. This means a major assault will be made against all res uh, restrictions on the rights of women that hide under the flimsy and uh, most, and in most cases, false, false mask of tradition. Nor will African liberation under the leadership of the African working class tolerate a social, uh, social economics and political uh, exploitation of sectors of the African nation and working class because of spurious bourgeois morality. You know, the bourgeoisie has a very spurious, I mean, it's morality. You know, like exploitation is moral. People being hungry, living under the worst kind, that's moral. Under them, the church going, you know, you have uh, these clowns who uh, uh, preach, they have some kind of moral, some kind of connection with gods, uh, you know, who walk amidst the, the most impoverished and poor, you know, passing out alms and having their, you know, hands kissed by poor people, that muck and mire that people live in, that's not defined as immoral. But in the midst of all of this oppression, uh, women who attempt to assert themselves, that's an immorality, that's an offense against God. Uh, uh, people uh, who... Uh, have a, a, a social, a sexual orientation uh, that differs uh, from that prescribed by them in, are immoral. Here you are, people living in the worst kind of oppressive circumstances. The, the circumstances they live in, they are not, that's not immoral. The fact that you got classes and nations who live at the expense of others, that's not immoral. Uh, but what's immoral uh, is the conduct of the people who uh, living under this oppression, etc. And that ain't gonna happen no more. Uh, uh, we will redefine what morality is all about. So only the African working class is compelled. Did I read that already? Uh, uh, compelled to uh, fight for the destruction of class society and the exploitation that, uh, yes, I did, produced it. Um, so, uh, we condemn the middle column. What about the middle? We, we condemn uh, the morality uh, and relations that permit Europeans, uh, imperialist corporations, uh, countries, and neo colonial thugs to exploit our people's lives and resources in Africa and to flaunt laws protecting sovereignty, the environment, and customs with impunity while attacking African people and the working class based on sexual orientation or relations between same gender loving individuals. That's, we, that's, that's going out the window. And everybody who's practicing that and preaching that stuff, that's where the real immorality uh, is. And uh, the African working class has no stake in oppressing anybody except the oppressor. And, and somebody's going to jail at minimum once we take power, uh, but it's not going to be people based on uh, their sexual orientation or uh, gender or anything like that, you know. So you got Bush, a fellow who proclaims to be heterosexual uh, uh, and, and proves it, uh, and, you know, pr praise a lot, he says, uh, and has this uh, really suspicious relationship with Condoleezza Rice, you know, uh, uh, so he's moral. He's moral, right? 
<laughs> he's moral, you know. Uh, no, we don't play that. And so you got all these crazy people and the so-called, these nationalists, these black nationalists who walk around condemning people in our own community. They need to be organizing to make the revolution. I don't care if, uh, if men wearing dresses participate in making this revolution, you know, it, I, we will make this revolution. And, and this nonsense about trying to separate and split the nation, that won't be tolerated. So, and, and the African working class coming to power uh, will mean the end of that uh, uh, concept of morality. So we say that the liberated African worker state will only oppress the imperialists and the neo-colonists who have surrendered Africa's future to them. Uh, we will call on the entire African working class and all African patriots to rise up against all who would uh, divide the nation and the working class based on the false uh, contradictions of sexual uh, identity, uh, ethnic uh, identity, and regional and uh, religious differences. That's part of what's killing us all over Africa today. And these guys want to add something else to, uh, to the list of things that separate and divide us. The African Revolution uh, that liberates and unites Africa and African people under African internationalism, the organized, conscious, and, and victorious leadership of the African working class will be the death knell of, imperial, of imperialist white power and capitalism as a world economy. So uh, the African revolution that liberates and, and uh, unites Africa and African people under African internationalism, the uh, organized, conscious, and victorious leadership of the African working class will be the death knell of imperialist white power and capitalism uh, as a world economy. It will, and it's really important for everybody to understand that capitalism was born as a world economy. It's not something that just popped up in New York uh, or, or Amsterdam, uh, etc. It's a world economy. And it's not something that just uh, functions uh, uh, in, in, the, in America and Europe. It functions also uh, in the most remote areas uh, of, of the world. Uh, that has uh, that areas have been untouched uh, by electricity and pavements and stuff like that. In fact, it is a consequence of capitalism that they have been untouched uh, by electricity, by pavement, by by decent housing and things to, of that nature. It uh, it was truly it will truly uh, allow it will it will finally allow uh, for the African workers to take social possession of the means of production. Our victory will mean the entire process of production, mining, building, manufacturing, shipping, uh, distribution, uh, etc. will come uh, through workers' councils throughout the production process. And so the end of bosses is what it will mean in part. The end of bosses, the producers, the workers, the ones who create the value in the real world are the people who that will have councils that will make the fundamental determinations of what production looks like, what has to be produced, uh, uh, etc. Uh, this will guarantee safety and creativity throughout. Um, workers will not uh, approve going into mines that are unsafe and and, uh, and improvement uh, in the production process will not be motivated by profit uh, that has no uh, regard for safety and, uh, and uh, prof I'm sorry, uh, proficiency otherwise, uh, but by the needs uh, and aspirations of workers as producers and consumers. I want you to think about this because uh, the bourgeoisie and white power, they say that one of the problems with Africans is that we think collectively. They say that we, we, and that individualism is what's necessary for success. They say this. They say because individualism means that everybody's trying to get over, and that's the thing that forwards uh, production and forwards creativity and forwards uh, development. But when you think in, uh, uh, collectively, they say, 
that nobody wants to go any place unless the whole group can go. <laughs> and so they say that's one of the problems that we have. But you think about this, uh, where uh, uh, you have this situation where development, production, is not defined by what's needed by the society, but by a handful of people who own and control the means of production. Now, first of all, they want to say that when you look at uh, Europe and North America, and they see that's the success of capitalism and individualism. They show that as an example of uh, how capitalism is so successful and what it has done, and it created all this productivity. But we say, no, 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 no. What capitalism has done <laughs> is deprive the people from, of, from production, mm -hmm. deprive the people from creativity, how many millions of people have been removed from the production process as a consequence of this stuff that's, that Europe has done to the rest of us? So when you see this so-called development in Europe, you're seeing something that comes as a consequence of the underdevelopment of the attack on other peoples around the world. That is not enhancing production. That is not what makes uh, production grows. That's placing severe limitations on production. I mean, first of all, we talk about the cure for cancer. How many people on those rickety boats uh, trying to escape Africa across the Mediterranean uh, are the people who would have cured the cancers? Or how many people who are uh, in these horrible conditions uh, throughout the Americas uh, who would have uh, continued a production process and food and stuff that wouldn't allow cancer to emerge in the first place? You know, uh, how, how many cancers are a direct consequence of, uh, and illnesses of, uh, of this, this profit-driven social system that we live in? So it's nonsense. And don't tell me that somebody is going to be less inclined uh, to uh, deal with problems and disease if it affects their cousin, their mama, their brothers and sisters, and their neighbors and people with whom they have relations, the workers, that the people they work with every day. The people go to work today, <laughs> when they go to work, they go to work today uh, with grudges, uh, hating their jobs, hating their bosses, and their productivity reflects the fact that they hate the boss, they hate the job, they hate every damn thing they're doing, and they just show up. But when you have the kind of society that we are talking about, where people come together and make decisions of what it is to uh, benefit and forward the society at large, that's when you're going to see productivity real productivity occur when you unleash the masses of the people uh, in a fashion that allows them to serve their own interests. The working class has to be liberated and that is going to result in the liberation of the nation. So, uh, somebody say, where was I? Uh, additionally, that's because uh, the state of the African uh, economy uh, smothered by the whims and requirements of imperialist white power has minimal industrial development. Much of the lackluster economic life is centered in the countryside because there isn't much development. So much of the, the economic life is centered in the countryside. The African uh, internationalist revolution will be the first major uh, step in, in the world in resolving the contradiction between the city and countryside. The full rapid development of Africa will require it. We will have to reorganize the African economy, uh, destroying all borders uh, into a full-fledged anti-colonial economy. Today's uh, Economic activity in Africa is tied to the interest of foreign imperialist uh, explorers. Every bit of food grown or not grown, every factory, every decision to develop a diamond, gold, iron, or bauxite mine instead of production that satisfies our needs is imperialist driven. We got diamond mines, and this is literally true. Diamond mines in communities, say, like in Sierra Leone, where people don't even have food to eat. What does a damn diamond mine do? And people need uh, uh, collard greens and other kinds of resources. And they, they have diamond mines, 
And the truth is that the vast majority of people in a place like Sierra Leone that bring the, do diamond mining all day for a cup of rice, right, uh, have never seen a finished diamond. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they go and they're digging these diamonds. They have never seen, the vast majority have never seen a finished diamond. They've never seen what you take for granted when you go to the mall and these shops there, etc. So people need food, clothing, housing, and when the people have control of this process that's not driven by profit, uh, then, you know, we will see real development. That's, that's the thing that's going to make real development. This whole notion that somehow this competition between the people is what creates productivity. We're saying that cooperation mm -hmm. among the people creates productivity. And one way you know it's true is because the bosses require you to cooperate uh, with the other workers, right, when they hire you. They don't hire you and have a, a factory or group of people working uh, for them who are constant fighting with each other. They, they can create what they call a programmed uh, kind of competition among them to get what they want, but it's, it's cooperation that's required. It has been the... Uh, imperialist driven economy that has forced so many African men, women and children from the artificially created uh, cruel conditions of the countryside in, into unsanitary and overcrowded uh, cultural crushing cities. The African working class uh, as the transistory ruling class will organize production based on the real needs of the people rather than the contrived, profit-driven, and profit-motivated needs of capitalists. Collective housing, neighborhood councils with the power to solve domestic problems, efficient public transportation, African educational systems, literacy eradication, Campaigns, I'm sorry, literary, literacy eradication campaigns, centers for music, cultural development, and socializing, birthing programs, and socially, socialist care for our elderly, time and centers uh, for reflection, revolutionary rehabilitation programs, uh, barefoot doctors uh, deployed into the community as in China and as in Cuba, places where lovers can go for privacy, will become ordinary features of life overturning the horrible day-to-day -day grind that characterizes our reality today. Even the control, uh, even the form of the future will, a family uh, will be reorganized under the rule of the African worker state. It will allow adults uh, to enter into agreements of relationships, uh, uh, agreements of relationship that are free from economic compulsion. Women will be assured economic uh, independence. Uh, uh, so financial uh, duress will not be a factor that determines uh, their commitment to a relationship nor enslaves their emotions. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, uh, you know, you got a situation, a society where women are, are supposed to be dependent economically dependent, paid too little to survive uh, independently in most instances, and, uh, and often uh, shamed uh, into staying home all the time and not getting any pay at all. Uh, and you have this situation where uh, the male is the one with the resources, the money, and, and how do you know, or maybe it's not that. Maybe you take the two, you, you, you require money from both of them in order to, the man and the woman, in order to survive. So how do you know who really loves whom? How do you know when your uh, relationship to somebody is informed uh, by the fact that you got to pay the mortgage or that if you leave, uh, you don't have any way you know, to take care of the children? How do you know when that's the dominant thing? How do you know when that's controlling your emotions? That you have to be in love with this person if you want to pay the mortgage. That you have to be in love with this person if you want to, 
you know, to, to have, uh, you know, any capacity as a human being, as a person. So we want to remove that so people can enter into real free relationships with each other. And so, you know, we come into a relationship not because of compulsion, not because mm -hmm. of duress, economic duress means that I have to stay with this person who I can't stand, I hate, you know, <laughs> and, and then wonder how the hell I got mixed up in this four years ago, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, so it's not economic duress that will make those determinations. People are free to come into and leave relationships based on what it is that they want to do as people. Whether, yeah, anyway, I almost went biblical. <laughs> uh, the uh, immediate role of the African worker state will be to function as a protector of society against uh, incestuous, uh, exploitative, and oppressive relationships and their consequences. African men and women can determine whatever arrangement <laughs> they contract among themselves with the state functioning as arbiter only until the time when the rule of habit and tradition overturns the rule of the state and becomes uh, unnecessary in human affairs. Our party also has a deep commitment to the well-being of our African children, recognizing that under the system of parasitic capitalism, our children live with daily trauma. They are uh, demeaned, are locked up, and uh, gunned down uh, by colonial police and tormented uh, in the white school system. The African People's Socialist Party follows in the footstep of the African Revolution of Haiti, whose uh, victory in 1804 uh, produced a progressive constitution that for the first time in history abolished all notions of an illegitimate child and pledged a commitment to the nurturing and protection of every child. This whole horrible concept of an illegitimate child. I mean, all of that stuff. And the form of the family itself, uh, and this is the form of the family under European domination. In this instance, we're talking about capitalist domination, but even going back to feudalism and stuff like that, the form of the family uh, is, is something that met European requirements and had no relationship to Africa and much of the world. The uh, African adage declaring the role uh, of the village in, in raising a child will be given new life. Women will be uh, freed from the burden uh, as isolated individual primary child care givers. The, fam the family uh, now becomes the society in a relationship that has the uh, force of law and uh, collective resources of the people that have been liberated from their role as surplus under private ownership within the capitalist system. This means the institution of uh, state-funded and administered nurseries and child care collectives that benefit parents and children in a manner that could uh, never happen under colonial capitalist society uh, developed through the uh, commodification of African parents and children. Parents and uh, the community at large will be able uh, to engage in a, uh, a, a stress-free, uh, non-competitive relationship with their children, with our children. The African Internationalist uh, Liberation and Unification of Africa and Africans worldwide will be the uh, major blow to destroy the entire capitalist system that was an outgrowth of colonialism. It will be the fundamental instru uh, instrument in the emergence of world socialist um, World Socialism providing the defining uh, economy. The defining economy. You know, just like the defining economy, economy of the world is capitalist. And uh, you've got societies where there's, you know, there's no real development or anything. And, and even countries where people try to engage in non-capitalist production and living, like Cuba. 
like what he tried to do in Venezuela uh, and other places in the world, but the defining uh, economy has been a capitalist economy. And these, these little minnows have tried to uh, exist in this whole capitalist economy. What we're saying is that a liberated African and African people then uh, uh, creates a defining economy by virtue of the fact that we're on every continent and every and we take Africa, 54, we, the, the richest continent on earth in terms of mineral, mineral uh, in terms of resources, uh, material resources. You talk about Africans who, uh, uh, throughout the what is now called the Americas and having a relationship with indigenous peoples there, a liberated, free African people, an African revolution, international revolution, then can restart economic development for humanity. I mean, so, it, you know, you're going to have these uh, islands, uh, isolated uh, forces who are trying to have capitalist economy going, but they can't exist. They will starve. Just like when you try to have socialism under capitalist domination, the so-called socialist states, they, they may uh, last for a generation or two, and then they collapse because they cannot compete, because they do not have access to the kinds of resources that the capitalists have access to. So you have now socialist production, and that is revolves around Africa and what the African Revolution has done around the world. It will starve. It will starve capitalist production. They can't, how can capitalist production happen if Africa is in the possession of African people? Uh, and, and if African labor and throughout the Americas in the possession of African people, it becomes a defining economy. That's what we're saying. The achievement of African international socialism, internationalist socialism, will be the essential force in the achievement of permanent world peace, easily understood when it is recognized that most wars are fought by states contending with each other and with peoples for profit generating markets and resources. We will replace capitalist competition with socialist cooperation, something uh, not possible before now. And I think this is supposed to be a sub here, the African Socialist Worker State, uh, but I'm going... So, it, uh, Les Juan was uh, Secretary General of the uh, Communist Party of Vietnam. Uh, with the responsibility of delivering the political report to their fourth Congress in late uh, December 1976. In his political report, Le Guan uh, spoke of the uh, possi possibilities of the socialist worker state after the conquest of national liberation. And I'm going to quote from Le Guan. Uh, now that our motherland has received complete independence, national uh, independence and socialism have become one. Okay? Now that our motherland has recovered complete independence, national independence and socialism have become one. Les Juan uh, continued, quote, uh, only under socialism can the age-old uh, dream of the working people come true, i.e. liberation from oppression, exploitation, poverty, and backwardness, a life in plenty with an assured tomorrow, a civilized and happy life. Only socialism can bring to the working people the full right to mastery and restore genuine human dignity to man, uh, enabling him to be the real master of society, of nature, and of himself. Under socialism, our motherland will have a modern economic, modern economy, advanced culture and science, strong national defense, uh, thereby ensuring our country's eternal independence, freedom, and ever more prosperous development. Only socialism can bring about the unification of our motherland at the highest and fullest degree in the fields of territory, political and moral life, economy, culture, society, as well as in the field of rights and duties, thereby 
fostering the solidarity and sincere and deep mutual love uh, between all members of society. Unquote. This is at least one. Uh, there will be no forced uh, idleness under post-liberated socialist construction in Africa and abroad. No forced idleness. No people pushed out of production, uh, demoralized um, by not being able to participate in the creation of life. That um, uh, standing on street corners idly or uh, turned uh, into flotsam, you know, uh, as they are on the capitalist colonialist uh, social system. Uh, refugees under underpasses with cardboard signs uh, saying, feed me, I'm hungry. Uh, under socialism, there will be no forced idleness in the African uh, uh, revolution. The work to build adequate infrastructure, housing, and schools, to electrify our cities and countryside, to grow food and purify our water and eradicate disease and the deadly mosquito are just some of the tasks guaranteed to offer full employment for our people for years to come. This is something that we can't do now. But we unleash this, the people and, and the society to begin to solve the problems of the society that we are confronted with in the society, in the world. And I said the society, but in nature as well. The mosquito, I mean, it's deadly, you know, uh, throughout Africa, malaria. Uh, it kills more people than AIDS in Africa. But nobody talks about that. And, you know, you know, you've got the guinea worm. You've got all kinds of contradictions that are there that would be resolved if Africa were free uh, to take on these contradictions. And free means having possession of our own resources, both human and material resources, our own brains and everything else. For uh, a productive this is a, a productive labor that cannot happen under colonialist capitalism that grinds down and demoralizes the worker and humiliates the African colonial subject. Capitalist production functions on the base of stolen lands and peoples. It is production that only pays workers and toilers for their ability to produce, never for what we produce. The difference in the two is what capitalists refer to as surplus value or profit. The capitalist keep this surplus for himself, though he never works or produces anything. The African worker state can only come into existence by the workers destroying the colonial base of the capitalist production, replacing the oppressive state of the colonialist capitalist and transforming surplus value into social wealth to provide for the well-being of society. I just told you all the stuff that would happen on the social and say, well, how is it going to happen? Where do the resources come from? Well, we take away the whole so-called surplus value. The capitalists steal all the value from the workers. They call it surplus. And, and now we're taking all that stuff back. We're taking it back. And what are we going to do with it? We're not, nobody's going to be talking about how somehow if you have free education or free uh, health care, or that somehow you living off somebody. No, the capitalists living off us. That's why we can't have free health care. Real health care. I mean, we own it. This hours. What, they don't, you don't give us anything. You don't give the working people in something because uh, free health care is allowed. It, the, the fact is we take the surplus value that you call profit that you've been hoarding for yourself. And, you know, trillions of dollars. You're hoarding for yourself. That's going back into society. It becomes, the, that's our hospitals. You know, that's our preventive care. Those are our roads. Those are the things that clear up the streams, that destroy the mosquitoes and take care, clear those ditches where, where mos uh, incubate mosquitoes that you find all over Africa and what have you. That's ours. And so uh, surplus value uh, becomes uh, something of the past. And now you have socialized ownership of all the means of production and uh, the consequences of that. The workers now own that. So... This is how the Africa uh, worker state will provide free health care, education, uh, housing, child care, etc. for the toiling masses through expropriating the stolen resources from the colonialist capitalists, uh, destroying the system of private ownership of social production, and creating a system of social ownership of social production. Uh, in a word, socialism, the early stage of communism. This is the new world we are fighting for in this party. 
It is not a world to be achieved through reforming police departments or improving police community relations within the U.S. or any place else. It is not something that can be achieved by a $15 per hour minimum wage for workers in general over a period of years. We will have to make a revolution under the leadership of the advanced attachment of the African working class, guided by the advanced theory of African internationalism, to initiate uh, the world from, uh, free from economic slavery and colonial oppression. This is why we must fight to put revolution on the political agenda for our people once again. Our recognition of the role played by imperialist parasitism in the advent of the capitalist system as a world system also gave the African people from the European feudal state that preceded it. Most white socialists and many progressives, unquote, recognize the state as a, a, a coercive uh, instrument in the service of the ruling class that is uh, necessary to protect the status quo from disruption and overthrow by exploited classes and to com uh, compete uh, with capitalists uh, internationally for profit at their expense. However, unlike other states in history, the capitalist state did not come into existence for the purpose of protecting a domestic social system. It was in organized to deal with the reorganization of the work world's uh, political economy that came into being as capitalism, requiring, uh, requiring the dispossession and enslavement of Africa and much of the world, providing uh, uh, previously uh, internal, external to Europe. The initial acts that gave birth, shape, and definition to the capitalist state uh, was killing and uh, controlling indigenous peoples, stealing and occupying foreign territories, and capturing, uh, forcibly dispersing and enslaving African people in Africa and abroad. In short order, it became a principal it became a popular white people state that employed enthusiastic and willing masses of white people as a form of institutionalized emergent state violence used to kill and take land from the indigenous peoples of what is now North America and Australia and to enslave Africans and others worldwide. In fact, part of the much touted progress of capitalism was this elevation of ordinary white people in uh, to the status of land owners uh, on stolen land and workers in a slave developed economy. This was the economic incentive for white men scalping indigenous people in the Americas, slaughtering uh, indigenous people in Australia and Africa, and waging an, un, uh, an independence quote unquote struggle against European uh, feudal states to steal indigenous lands throughout South America. The brutality of the capitalist state uh, against Africans within the U.S. and also and elsewhere, uh, the viciousness of the capitalist state uh, in, uh, in subduing African, uh, indigenous, uh, Asian, and other peoples is not an anomaly. It is uh, inherent to its nature and consistent with its uh, genesis as a state protecting a social system rooted in colonial slavery. While the capitalist state is a coercive institution that sometimes mistreats, jails, and even shoots uh, its European subjects, citizens who get caught uh, in the friendly fire, its primary purpose is the violent suppression of the colonized population. As African internationalists, uh, as African internationalism has explained, white people function as part of the capitalist state. It is uh, in its uh, treatment of, of Africans, Mexicans, uh, the end of, I'm sorry, the end of indigenous, indigenous etc., its true function as a uh, colonial state is raw and exposed. 
the purpose of the U.S. state is, its, uh, is to contain the other, the colonial pedestal, the colonial pedestal upon who, which, it, uh, which all capitalist activity uh, occurs and which uh, benefits the entire colonizer population. This is why all Europeans control, European control uh, countries, uh, white citizens, this is why in all European countries, white citizens are generally united with efforts of the state uh, to crush any form of African and colonized resistance. It is true that democracy is a form of the state. However, for the colonized, the, uh, uh, the uh, pr pursuit of democracy is the struggle to limit and uh, is to limit and eliminate the intervention of the colonial state in their lives and affairs. This is why our party has raised the demand for black community control of the police and the popular struggle against police murder in the U.S. This is why we have an institution instituted have instituted numerous African uh, people's tribunals to try and judge colonial aggressions against our peoples wherever. Uh, people whether, whether uh, for reparations or police murder. So, um, I, I think we're uh, going to find we have enough time for uh, some pretty decent discussions. So we're going to take uh, just a um, three or four minute uh, uh, time break and come right back to you. Uh -huh. and then we get back to questions, discussions. Uh -huh. You on mute? Yeah. Do you have a say? Call the PSA. This study was brought to you by the African People's Socialist Party Department of Agitation and Propaganda. We are committed to winning the war of ideas. If you are learning from these studies, please donate to help us improve the quality of education for Africans worldwide by going to theburningspear.com and clicking on donate. You can also support by ordering an uneasy equilibrium or sponsoring a prisoner with the Burning Spear newspaper. Coming up for, in December 9th through 16th, join us on the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise. Join us on a fun-filled African-centered cruise with this unique perspective and insight of Oma Chairman Omali Eshetela. We will go to the Bahamas, St. Thomas, Puerto Rico, and Grand Turk. Book today at 888-720-2443 or visit uhurulegacycruise.org. The All African People's Development and Empowerment Project will be holding their 10th anniversary convention in Huntsville, and Alabama from November 17th through the 19th. This highly anticipated event will be a call to Africans around the world to give their skills in the areas of education, agriculture, health care, economic development, and emergency relief to the African nation to further ABDET's mission and vision. Join us this fall for, the, for this momentous occasion. For more information, go to developmentforafrica.org. The Black is Back Coalition is hosting a March on Washington this November 4th through 5th in Washington, D.C. March in the White House on Saturday, November 4th at noon at Malcolm X Park under the theme The Ballot and the Bullet, Elections, War, and Peace in the Era of Donald Trump. The conference will be held on Sunday. For more information, please go to blackisbackcoalition.org or call 786-505-9859. The African People's Education and Defense Fund presents the One Africa, One Nation, Uhuru Book Fair and Flea Market. The market will be hosted on Saturday, October 14th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. in Clark Park, located at 43rd and Chester Avenue in West Philly. Omali Ashitella will be the keynote speaker. The market will include a children's circle, live music, African authors and booksellers, 
poetry, food vendors, education resources, and much more. For more information, go to uhurubookfair.blogspot or .com or apedf.org. We will now open the discussion for questions and answers. If you have questions or comments for the chairman, you can unmute yourself at this time by hitting star five. All callers are muted. All callers are unmuted. Oh, comrades. We have uh, some time for discussion. I really would like for us to do that. I think that we've um, opened up uh, some really uh, uh, important kinds of issues uh, that most of us should be interested in uh, grappling with. So, um, like I said, it's now open for discussion. Uhuru. Maybe we should... Yeah. If you're not if you're not speaking, please mute. Let's do it this way. Um, let's mute everyone, and then in all, when you want to come on, you can just unmute yourself by doing what, comrade? Star five. Doing star five. You can unmute yourself at, with star five. All callers are muted, and they can unmute themselves. So you can unmute yourself by simply hitting star uh, five. It, uh, we think that's uh, necessary because uh, when we unmuted everybody, it was, there was a lot of disturbance. So uh, someone was, I think, uh, about to speak. And let's go ahead and enter into this discussion. Uhuru. You unmute yourself by doing star five. If star five is not working, star six. Oh, please, but now we should know. Unmute yourself by star five or star six. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yes, come at. Bakri in Oakland. Bakri in Oakland. <laughs> Baki wants to get uh, right to the act of uh, <laughs> payback. <laughs> but uh, now here's what we I think is really important. We can't say everything with uh, specificity, but we do know that we're talking about deconstructing, uh, with destroying the state apparatus as it is, and uh, talking about the worker state. The Cubans tried to do some things with the worker state, and I think other uh, 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 socialist states have tried to do that too, uh, creating uh, in communities uh, throughout. You know, you uh, have uh, defense, community defense uh, organizations that uh, the party has institutionalized, uh, instituted, uh, where you have the armed uh, population. Uh, you couldn't trust people in this country with guns, uh, uh, but you have an armed population and uh, organized uh, armed population and uh, I see being able to institutionalize uh, in various communities uh, the ability uh, to render justice. Uh, and, but I think what's really important to understand about this is that uh, dictatorship is ruled without regard for law. And uh, we live under colonial, uh, bourgeois colonial uh, dictatorship. That's why, uh, for example, here where I am currently, in St. Louis, a uh, cop uh, was able uh, to run down and execute a 24-year-old African uh, man uh, and be seen planting a gun uh, on him to justify killing the African 
and uh, actually having DNA tests show that the only DNA on the gun was by the cop. And then the judge will say the cop is not guilty. Dictatorship is ruled without regard for law. In most instances, in what they call a democracy like the United States of Europe, the dictatorship is hidden. It's a hidden dictatorship, but it's there nevertheless. Uh, uh, it's not hidden to colonial subjects. Uh, that's why white people don't get it when we say all this stuff happened to us and they say, well, you must have done something, right? Because the dictatorship is hidden. Uh, it's a hidden dictatorship. Uh, bourgeois dictatorship is hidden in most instances under de democratic institutions. So the point that I'm making is that uh, with the seizure of state, with the destruction of the bourgeois state and the seizure of uh, state power, African people, we, we initiate a, a, a dictatorship of the proletariat, a proletariat dictatorship, a workers' dictatorship. The bourgeoisie has no rights. It, the former bourgeoisie has no rights. They have no right to free speech. No, you cannot have access to this building to have a meeting where you can get together to start talking about uh, oppressing uh, everybody else uh, again, uh, reinstating yourself uh, uh, and so the people's uh, uh, working workers uh, or proletariat dictatorship will prevail, uh, and and so I can say that for sure. That's what we're talking about. And you're right, Comrade Bakri, in what seems to be inferred by what you said. I mean, we're going to need fewer jails because there are going to be fewer people who we're going to have to put in jail. Uh, and certainly a lot of people like connected to the bourgeoisie and their particular terrorists in our communities uh, who at minimum will have to be jailed. At minimum will have to be jailed. Um, they're going to pay a bloody price. I mean, that, I'm, make no mistake about it. There's no way that we're going to be able to resolve this thing and then go into the future without destroying everything that is associated uh, with the past that uh, has tried to defend the past, defend slavery, defend colonialism, etc. So I can't say too much uh, in, uh, in terms of specifics, but the, to the extent of organization that we can create uh, uh, will have a lot to say about how that looks so that there is an actual process uh, that we establish, uh, an organized process that we establish that will be able to um, uh, to render uh, justice to uh, uh, to all of them, and to expropriate, to expropriate the expropriators, to take back uh, the, the resources that they have stolen, and I don't have time now to elaborate much on that, but I could give you some examples of how that has happened. Some of that has happened in the past. Uhuru, I want to open it up for anybody oh, else. Star six. Star six. Oh, okay. Star six. If you Uhuru. Oh. Yes. Where you at? Where you at, KF? I was looking at what Bakri, the question that Bakri just posed, and he himself has been a part of uh, uh, creating dual and contending powers. And I think that the party has done an excellent job at creating a uh, uh, mechanism that will be able to put the bush on the on trial. And look the world trial be on, on reparations for African people and the black grand jury that the party and it be has organized throughout uh, the years, I think maybe one of the first coming in open up about two years. So that gives us at least a starting point to be able to uh, uh, to, to issue working people's, uh, black working people's uh, uh, justice. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think that's a great point that Kay Fing just made, uh, that all of our work, uh, you know, it's not just some idealistic stuff that we do, but we actually uh, put in place uh, instruments that uh, our design is to create power, even as we're making a revolution. So that's why uh, here in the St. Louis Ferguson area, when the uh, white people of state uh, refused to indict Darren Wilson for the murder of 18-year-old uh, Mike Brown, uh, we initiated a black people's grand jury. We've had our own uh, tribunals and things like that. So uh, we are putting much of the actual structure for that in place in different places and there are things that can be replicated all over the world. In fact, uh, uh, we are building uh, with the uh, African Socialist International, we're building for uh, what we've called uh, an international uh, tribunal 
uh, for reparations, where we actually, on, around the world, we're going to act, actually have people come to a certain location uh, from throughout the world uh, to participate in, this, in describing and defining uh, the process of rape of Africa and African people worldwide. So, uh, thank you for that intervention, Comrade Kefin. Anyone else? Uhuru. 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 Uh, yeah, Uhuru Chairman. This is um, Columbine. Uhuru, Comrade. Um, I really want to, Uhuru, I really want to appreciate this political education. Um, uh, it's really, really good. And I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm in St. Louis, um, Ferguson area, where I was born. I'm from St. Louis. Um, okay. Nevertheless, um, I really wanted to go back and wanted to see if you can deepen in um, when you were talking about, uh, you know, the neocolonial um, and how it had to be destroyed. Because I, I had just been watching what's happening in St. Louis and around the world, and neo-colonial uh, puppets, you know, the heavy bourgeoisie, um, they look, they, they start to look like the working class and speak like the working class, um, and even sometimes try to, or a lot now, I see, like, will even say revolution, and, um, because they have to. And so I, I just didn't know, like, if you could, say more about this because I really I really see that like um, you know I see like just a whirlwind of ideas but no one is really um, struggling you know um, really saying that we have to yeah. entertain the idea of um, yeah. self-determination they, they they only talking about reforms but they try to make it seem that that is building a new world but so they, really they don't just talk about study. they don't only mm-hmm. talk about reform see it'd be one thing if the only thing they were doing was talking about reform. They don't just do that. They fight against revolutionary uh, uh, intervention. They fight against revolutionary solutions. It's not just that they talk about reform, but they also fight against revolution and revolutionary intervention, and that's the thing that makes them problematic. And the fact is that I'm glad you raised that, because, again, we're talking about this whole question of class. And it does exist, and it did not exist in this fashion before uh, we came into, uh, we were dominated by imperialism or before that intervention uh, through, uh, through the uh, imperial economy in, in, uh, into our lives as Africans. But at, when that happens, then there's a sector of the African population that got, got, gets attached to the imperialist economics and through that, through imperialist politics. And so this is the, where you see the rise of these capitalist-influenced uh, Negroes, not just in the African community here, but throughout the whole world. There was a time when even Africans uh, uh, who uh, uh, might have had mealy-mouth uh, explanations, they were at least patriotic. Uh, and but t- today, what you see is that uh, many of them have become what we call compradors. I mean, absolutely sell out, sold out to the bourgeoisie. Here's the thing that we have to deal with. First of all, all petty bourgeoisie are not compradors. All of them are not sellouts. But as a class, the petty bourgeoisie will always betray the revolution. As a class. The petty bourgeoisie will always betray the revolution. However, there are individuals from the petty bourgeoisie that can separate itself, that can commit class suicide, and and can betray uh, the interests of the petty bourgeoisie and unite with the interests and aspirations of the working class. We see that throughout history. We see that even in most recent situations. I mean, Karl Marx himself was uh, from the aristocracy. Uh, 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 you're talking about people like Che Guevara, petty bourgeois doctor uh, from Argentina who uh, betrayed the interests of that social force. And by the way, the petty bourgeoisie is quietly as kept as a dying social force. Uh, Fidel Castro, uh, 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 even Mao Zedong, who was a peasant, uh, but upper peasant, uh, etc. So as a class, the petty bourgeoisie will always betray the revolution. There are individuals, however, from the petty bourgeoisie who can betray, uh, can, can commit class suicide by 
uh, by uh, uniting with the interests of the workers and peasants and making that their interest, their, their aspirations. Now, uh, part of what we're seeing is that in the first place, uh, we see like, uh, uh, we see this even in, in housing projects where uh, sometimes uh, people who uh, emerge as leaders in uh, fighting for the rights of the, of the, of the poor and, and tenants uh, end up being co-opted by uh, the, the, the government and what have you, and they become instruments uh, of, uh, of, uh, of government to, to make sure that the status quo remains. They, they, they're good at it. And there are sectors of the population like that who uh, come from the working class. And every now and then you will see them that will sell out the interests of the working class. And uh, some of them, they are bribed. You know, they, they, they talk better than, than a lot of the others. They, you know, they're smooth and what have you. And they're smart. And the petty bourgeoisie and the, and the ruling class works all the time in trying to seduce uh, 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 persons uh, from our community who seem to be, uh, uh, you know, bright, who seem to be energetic and what have you, and who, especially if they have the potential, forever rising to be something that could contend with bourgeois power. And they seduce these persons and they, they corrupt them uh, and bring them into the system. And, the, and these are people who often see themselves as smarter than all the, all the rest of the black people anyway. They talk better, they're smarter, uh, etc. Uh, uh, and they just, you don't know how to play the game. Some of them, you met some of them who said, yeah, but you just don't know how to play the game. And so they play the game at the expense of our people. And uh, that's part of what it is that we run into. And that's what we look at all the time. And like I said, they're smooth. Barack Hussein Obama was smooth. This guy was smooth. Uh, but he was a stone seller, a comprador. He's unredeemable. There's nothing that can redeem Barack Hussein Obama. I mean, he is a, <clears throat> a conscious traitor uh, to black people. He is the one who called himself. He used one of the most derogatory terms for black people uh, that that used to I used to read about this uh, <clears throat> in the fifties coming from clans people and uh, like that when he that used to refer to Africans as 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 uh, as mongrels and uh, and things like that Barack Obama called himself a mutt a mutt is a mongrel and he made this public kind of statement he was identifying with white power and and uh, and he was you he can't be a mutt by himself everybody. Like him, is he, he's mongrelized the whole African population because of this racial purity notion that exists, you know, among white power. So, you know, yeah, we got sellouts like that. And our objective all the time has to be to go to the people and to build our own revolutionary, uh, uh, you know, capacity because we're going to isolate them uh, through what we do uh, in winning the people to revolution, revolutionary consciousness. And I spent a lot of time on that. Uh, I, and I suspect it wasn't satisfactory, but... <laughs> anybody <clears throat> anybody else? Oh, Chairman, this is Dia. Oh, Dia, you reemerged. <clears throat> yeah, I was trying to unmute with Star 5 earlier, but um, yeah, uh -huh. that, that was You were working right. with bad information. <laughs> That's right, Dia. Throw that criticism out right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's disguised as it may be. <clears throat> Go ahead. All right, so we have a question um, from Facebook by Robert from New Jersey, um, and it states, there is a criticism all over the Internet by so-called African nationalists about the African People's Socialist Party allowing whites to work in solidarity and under the leadership of APSP. Can you speak to why it is important to have a Huru solid be can you speak to why it is important to have the Uhuru Solidarity Movement working to collect and pay reparation? Well <laughs> why is it important to have anybody doing reparations? The thing is that <clears throat> uh, the nationalists say they believe in reparations, but they now they're gonna say that they don't believe in the reparations that we are acquiring, the organization that we've created to make reparations happen. They like reparations, the idea, but they don't like reparations, the fact, the reality. And that's what we engage in, reality. We are not idealists, we are materialists, one. So that's an aspect of it. But the other aspect of it has to do with a certain kind of race nationalism. That's not about the capture of political power. It's about hating this person or disliking and say, oh, well, the white people didn't. Yes, the white people did and do right now horrible things. But what do we have to do to win political power? If you only look at this from a strategical point, a practical strategical point, 
Like white people look at it from a strategic point. That's why whoever sent that message probably got a job in a white person's corporation or white person's office today. They didn't do it because they were trying to help you. They would do it because they're trying to help themselves. They, that's why <clears throat> when you go to the bank and see a black teller there, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that the black people own the bank. It means that they want you to come and feel comfortable bringing your money to their white bank. And so if you just think about it, only in a mercenary, purely practical of fashion, strategic fashion. If you can't recognize the significance of having a sector of the white population on a strategic, just a tactical, strategic manner, a gross, self-serving manner, to have a sector of the white population working in the white community to fracture, to split the white community so that when we're trying to make this revolution that we're not fighting against the whole white community like you're trying to make us do by trying to split the people away from the party with some nonsense like that. We do this because we're scientists, because we're trying to make a revolution. And then beyond that, I want to say this, that white people have been responsible for a lot of horrible stuff that, in our lives, and they've created a new world at our expense. But we don't see white people as being mysterious, that they are people, just like other people. And, and once we know they're people, we also know several other things. One, uh, like the Vietnamese, they were able to defeat them. And the Vietnamese were able to defeat them, although they had huge white-led anti-war demonstrations throughout the United States and throughout Europe who were connected to the Vietnamese Revolution. And the Sandinistas were able to do the same thing from Nicaragua, had white solidarity forces who were doing this kind of work uh, to forward the revolutionary movement. And so that's one thing that I think is really important for us to understand. But the other thing is this, that we are not trying to reproduce the society that white people have created, nor the ideas that white people have created. We are talking about building a new world that makes the assumption that human beings uh, are motivated uh, by uh, things in the real world, material interests, and even the, the way white people perform and act is something that's uh, that uh, responds to uh, the way that white people have got their living at the expense of somebody else. If you want to make it impossible for this relationship that we have with white people to continue, help us make the revolution and bring everybody who can be brought to the revolution to overthrow white power. If you can get white people to help you overthrow white power, would you be crazy enough not to do it? I mean, the thing is that that's the objective, to destroy white power, to build uh, to destroy colonialism, to liberate Africa and African people around the world, and to create a new kind of world where everybody can live, uh, everybody wants to be able to live together, we can make that possible uh, by fighting for black power and winning everybody who wants to unite with us to make that happen. I don't have a better explanation than that. Anybody else? Comrades? Uhuru? Yeah, we have one here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm Kabula Mutumba from Chicago, and uh, I know that the, the bourgeoisie is trying hard to define, you know, what the African Revolution will look like. Um, there's this show, Blackish, uh, that's being promoted. There's a clip all over the internet where, um, you know, the, the lead guy, uh, what's his name? Anthony Anderson. A Anthony Anderson says, oh, black people have been treated so bad every day since slavery, since day one, but we love America. And, and this is the theme of the, the whole show, if, if you ever uh, have to look at it. <laughs> uh, also in Chicago, there's this uh, big building put up. Uh, it's, a, it's a hospital, it's the Austin Community Clinic, and there are um, African national flags everywhere. It's like five in the window. It's a huge building, and there's a statue of um, Martin Luther King in the form of, uh, from Benin style. And um, in his hand is a broken sword standing for nonviolence. <laughs> so they, you know, they really, and, and it's on a street called Mandela Road. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so they're really trying hard to define it. So we have to. We gotta make. We gotta define it. Yeah. And, um, the part is Department of Agitation and, and Propaganda and the party. We we need your uh, your help to create this vision. Right on. I mean, I think that uh, Kabula said it all. 
That's the reality. And we are in this great contest. We're in this great contest in St. Louis. We're in this contest in general. There's a sector of, uh, of there's a sector, there's, there's a real uh, uh, program. There's a real uh, process of, uh, at work now, uh, anticipating uh, the rise of uh, the Black Revolutionary Movement. Uh, uh, and seeing it happen, seeing this thing unfolding right before their very eyes, and they want to define what it is that we should do. And uh, like I'm in St. Louis now, and there are protests every day. There have been protests every day here since uh, the 15th of, uh, of September. And, uh, but they don't offer up any demands. They don't challenge the social system at all. And the bourgeoisie loves that. They, they love a protest that doesn't challenge them, that doesn't uh, say anything. Uh, and now we're talking about uh, they uh, defining that, uh, yeah, America's horrible, horrible, but we still love it, you know? I mean, uh, <laughs> what do you call those kinds of relationships that uh, where you constantly brutalize it? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, <laughs> it's it's just horrible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, but yeah, what they're trying to do is head off uh, this struggle and they're trying to define it. That's, I think you're right, Kabula. You just made a statement about the significance of the party right now in terms of the work that we have to do in helping people to come to revolutionary conclusions. I, I think they think that uh, there's something simmering. They know there's an incipient thing that's out here. And so they're not trying to sit, get in front and say, don't struggle, don't make the revolution. They're trying to say, now, this is how you go. This is where you go. This is the way forward, that we recognize your anger. What does Clinton say? I feel your pain. <laughs> we feel your pain, etc. Uh, uh, but this is how you deal with it. Uh, take an aspirin and, and, and two days later call your doctor, something like that, right? Don't, don't amputate. Don't uh, uh, do anything else. And our responsibility is to build revolutionary consciousness and organization among the people. Uhuru. I've, thank you for that intervention. Anything else on Facebook? Anything else on Facebook? Star six. No, Chairman, um, this would be a not at this time, but I, um, I just want to appreciate the, the, the Sunday study and um, just go back to the statement you made about, um, you know, the restructuring of the African family and the statement that you made um, as, you know, parents not being non-competitive. I just wanted to know if you could deepen that, that statement. Well, let me just say this, that people take for granted the form of the family that you get born into. And this is a form of a family that's been imposed on the world by Europe, this whole sense of morality and everything else. Uh, it, it revolves around, um, in many ways, uh, the oppression of women and children. Um, it defines the family uh, uh, as this uh, tiny, they call it what, a nuclear family, is that how they define it? Uh, where you have a, a father and a mother and uh, two children and a dog, uh, something like that. Uh, everybody else is not family. You know, the, you find that even uh, when you have jobs and you want to leave to go to a funeral of your grandmother, she's not considered part of the family or your cousin or your uncle, they're not family. That ain't, that ain't, certainly is not how Africans uh, have always, you know, been, you know, and, and so they call that the nuclear family. And other forms of the family, uh, and this is relatively recent, and uh, we've, been, we've been introduced to it. Uh, monogamy, uh, polygamy, all these other uh, things. I mean, families come in different, have come in different forms historically, and... Uh, that, I mean, one reason that, uh, you know, Africans, you know, refer to each other as brothers and sisters, uh, as quiet as it's kept. And, you know, like you go to the store and you see uh, all these stolen resources that they call Aunt Jemima's or Uncle Ben's. There's an Uncle Ben, there's an Uncle Tom, uh, because throughout our societies, the older people are often referred to as, as Uncle Baba, Father, uh, sister, brother, the form of our families have always been different. So that you might have an entire village that's married to another village. I mean, uh, I'm told 
uh, in the Maasai uh, in East Africa and Kenya that uh, if a man uh, returns home and there's a spear in, in front of his hut, that means that uh, somebody else is there with his wife. So he moves along, unless it's a short man. <laughs> if it's a short man, he kill him because he doesn't want to have any short sons. You understand? <laughs> he won't want to have short sons. You understand? Even that concept yes. is going to be his son. Yes. You know, uh, so the form of the family has been different in different places. And what I'm saying is that the form of the family should not be uh, informed by duress and that human beings, men and women, adults, uh, can uh, have contracts with each other in terms of what the form of the family should be. I think for as long as the state exists that the state will have a function here uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of somehow validating or somehow uh, of the contracts that we come into with each other. You know, uh, who is in this relationship? Is important. We'd have to protect from incest and stuff like that. The state would have to do that initially and have to make sure uh, that children are taken care of, etc. But uh, people can come into contract with the, the relationship that they want. There's no economic duress, so now people are not in the relationship based on money, uh, etc. So uh, uh, a family uh, will look like uh, how the people in the, in the relationship wanted to look like, and, and uh, that's, the, that's what I'm, I'm saying. And, and when I say a family, I mean a family. I mean men, women, I mean human beings coming into these relationships voluntarily and contracting what this relationship looks like. And we need contracts because we don't want chaos in the society. We, don't, we want to be able, and this will only be something that happens for as long as the state exists, because I think once this normalizes in society, people can enter into relationships uh, freely, you know, uh, however the form uh, will take. Whatever the form uh, looks like, human beings should have the right to be able to come into those relationships. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to appreciate this study, and it's particularly the part where you're talking about um, you know, the family unit and move, like being obligated to love someone because you are short on resources or you have met them and like maybe they change. Yeah. Because a lot of the times, like when people are in, you know, abusive relationships, they are being held in those relationships by force, not because it's not that they don't want to leave, but because they've been persuaded by their spouse not to have a job because, you know, they, the, you know, like the spouse is taking care of everything. And so, uh, you know, like that, it's not not even a question of love anymore, it's a question of like, I literally cannot escape this person because I don't have the means to do so, because my family doesn't have the means to help me, um, you know, like there's no resources in my entire family so I can't escape this person, and you know, just knowing that you don't have to deal with that anymore, like there's not going to be this issue of, you know, this person is holding me hostage through money, this person is holding me hostage through resources, you know, will free up a lot of people from, you know, living under abusive systems, it will free up a lot of children from having to, that are, you know, like a lot of our families that are broken right now because there's a cycle of abuse that happens, you know, whether through like molestation or through like um, hitting or verbal, you know, like any kind of abuse, the mother isn't able to leave. And so like the kids are now in the situation where they grow up and they become abusers yeah. and, you know, like freeing up these people from having to be obligated to stay in these relationships we really do a lot to heal the the you know mentality and the cycle the psychological issues that we are experiencing in our communities all the time because we won't have children that are growing up being abused. Yeah, and I think also the economic thing is really powerful, but also like the tradition. So there's a the question of shame that's associated with the dissolution of these relationships too. So we, we change the society, we change the form of the family, so there's no shame associated with you leaving somebody who's beating you, to, you know, damn near to death every, every weekend or something to that effect. Uh, there, there's, you know, and, and, you know, disappointing this person in the family. The family form of the family changes, and it changes the entire uh, society itself. Uh, it's no longer this assumption that this family is something just restricted to these individuals and their children. Now there's a whole different conception of the family, and that opens, that really liberates uh, people, liberates children, uh, and the community itself. Uh -huh. How you think about the family can change. How you can think about these relationships change. Uh -huh. I only have, what, uh, 
uh, a couple of minutes. Is there anyone else who wanted to? Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru. Uhuru, this is Gazi from Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> Gazi from Atlanta, <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> Uhuru Chairman, I really, <laughs> I really want to appreciate um, this study and um, just especially what Columbia said in the beginning around uh, these natural disasters and how they cause devastation to African people and oppress people around the world. And it's not um, a natural occurrence of why these uh, were so vulnerable to these uh, storms and earthquakes and mudslides, but the uh, colonial contradiction, which uh, has forced us and coerced us into living uh, these impoverished, in these impoverished like societies. And even when we were leaving um, St. Petersburg, uh, to go to St. Louis uh, during the Irma, uh, Irma hurricane coming on the road, you know, a lot of my comrades can witness that when we were on the road coming uh, on the highways, we would just see, um, of course, there was like a sea of cars, but one, there wasn't that many Africans uh, leaving. And then the Africans that were leaving, it was in these cars that had everybody was in these cars. Like, uh, grandmama, auntie, uncle, cousins, everybody, is, as many bodies in the car as possible can be in that car. And you could even see, you know, these are cars that, you know, you don't even know if it's going to make the whole trip. And then the hiking of the prices of the gas. And then you see these white people, and it's a, a lot, majority white people, white cars or white people in the cars. And when you look into their cars, they have these huge SUVs, Mm. and it's literally them and their dog. Mm. Like one person and a dog in a huge SUV. Mm. And this is the person that's uh, escaping, and they have all this space, and the space is left for, like, their equipment and things like that. So I'm just really excited about building a uh, new world and building an Africa that we have, the working class has dictatorship over our resources, and we can create societies and infrastructures that can withstand uh, these storms and these uh, natural disasters. And because a lot of the rhetoric that's put out there is that, you know, well, these storms really pull us all together because storms don't see color and da 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 Well, obviously they have to see some kind of color because it's not. Y'all see no white people on the top of their mansion waving <laughs> for FEMA to come save them. Like, you see African people, you know, on these, ho- on these small houses that are uh, unstable waiting to ask for, you know, to be um, saved. And just the uh, whole crisis of everything that's going on um, with imperialism is just uh, consistent every day and a lot of times really hard to even keep up with. And I'm really uh, appreciative of these Sunday studies from just seeing, like, the mass shootings and Trump against Korea and North Korea and all these kinds of things uh, consistently happening in the media and in the world. Um, one thing is I do enjoy seeing is I was watching uh, some television with uh, Kim Kardashian and she was visiting Mexico and she was crying in her hotel room because she said when she was coming off of the plane, the people saw that she had like Chanel and diamonds on and she was scared that the people were going to come into her hotel room and uh, take her Chanel away from her. She's calling her friend and her friend is like, I deal with the same thing when I travel. You need to take a Xanax and just calm down and I know it's scary, and I'm just like, yes, Kim, we are coming for those diamonds and the Chanel people are rising. All right, comrade, all right, all right. right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get out of here. I just wanted to uh, uh, thank everybody for coming on, and uh, I wanted to just, uh, f- the final statement is, uh, the worker state uh, will eliminate other kinds of contradictions. I mean, even things in society like jealousy, uh, that permeate so much of the society. If you got the form of the family that I'm just talking about, what does that mean in terms of jealousy, in terms of relationships between people, etc.? And if you've got a society that's not based on exploitation and uh, some people living at the expense of others, you have, don't have to be jealous of what somebody else has because, you know, everybody, you know, has more or less the same. We can all get it. And so it's just a whole different kind of social world that we're looking at. I want to thank everybody for coming on, and um, we'll see you again uh, next Sunday uh, at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, Uhuru.